Um, I'm Ian Trump. I uh, work for a company called SolarWinds. Um, in charge of their SaaS um, products, which are a whole bunch of different uh, products. I come at the information security thing from more of a uh, attacker perspective, having basically served in the Canadian military as well as the RCMP. And um, I really tend to try and figure out how the bad guys are going to get into our infrastructure and then from the infrastructure pivot to our actual customers. So this presentation is, um, uh, has got a mix of information, including a few uh, ranty moments uh, against the security industry in general. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the experience that I had on a project called the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. As you can imagine, a museum with the title Human Rights on it is probably a pretty big target for countries that are not that excited about a place where all of their misdeeds are going to be chronicled. So um, a lot of what I learned about being attacked and continually attacked by what we think is probably foreign nation state adversaries, we don't really have anything that a criminal that is interested in making a profit would really have there. Um, so we were pretty certain that the type of adversary that we were going to be dealing with would be fairly advanced in terms of capabilities. As a result of all of that great knowledge with system architects as well as security teams, we came up with a bunch of different ways that we could ward off the bad guys, including a heavily virtualized environment where instances would be spun up for specific tasks and then completely destroyed and wiped in order to then create a new virtual instance. So almost in a lot of cases, a server on demand and then uh, killing it and then rebuilding it. So if you were at DEF CON, you would have uh, seen the DARPA demonstrations and heard a lot about sort of what we're talking about in terms of exploitation in an automated sense. And um, the reason I bring this up to the table is that um, I have some thoughts about if the US government is willing to show us what they have managed to do with a bunch of university teams, I tend to think that they have something behind the curtain that they haven't trotted out yet. This was a very, very powerful message to other adversaries that the United States is investing heavily in automated exploit pen testing capability. Now, the good news was that when facing the hacker community in DEF CON, this machine was trounced by some of the best and brightest pen testers in the world. So pen testers, you're not out of business. Um, the idea behind this is there's an autonomous system capability on the offense and also on the defense. And that's something I kind of wanted to get into my presentation because of a bunch of drivers. Those drivers are really about um, the SaaS cloud um, and the idea that you can take on-prem capability and push it up to the cloud and save some money doing that. Um, we can question that. It seems that Amazon's profits are getting larger and larger with each quarter. Um, so I'm not 100% sure that the cloud is all its truly costs are going down. Um, I think, though, what we've seen in the last few mega breaches, ranging from Talk Talk to the Ashley Madison breach in Canada, that trust is a central part of the cloud strategy. And if you neglect that trust, if you are willful and negligent about your customer data, there is a very good chance that you will be punished, right? And punished to the extent that Talk Talk was under the DPA in um, the UK, which they found them guilty of basically negligence when it came to cybersecurity. This was underscored by the fact that a 14-year-old armed with SQL map was able to own them. So the ICO essentially said, here's a 400,000 British pound fine, go find a web application firewall, because you should have probably had one in the first place. One of the things that I also wanted to talk about is the SaaS cloud, as it were, has some very unique attack vectors that we hadn't considered with our on-prem. In the traditional on-prem environment, you basically have a network perimeter, 
That's pretty much a given. You've got your firewalls, and if you kind of know what you're doing, you're writing egress filtering, and you're doing a lot of stuff to make it difficult on the bad guys. When you put your stuff up into the cloud without compensating controls, essentially anybody can log into your dashboard. In most cases, you'd really appreciate it if it was your customers and not people that are looking to try and wreck the um, infrastructure that you've so carefully built. So what, what is really this boiled down to is once you are established up there, um, you need to protect your infrastructure and your customer data and your customers need to make sure that their endpoints are secured as well. So you have almost now doubled your regular exposure when you think about the attack vectors. So when we think about what is coming at us, we've seen a number of case histories, right? The external hackers, DDoS attacks, but specifically around the password reuse problem. That's where a whole bunch of accounts, I believe we think patient zero was Yahoo, was then used in an attack on LinkedIn, which was then subsequently used on attacks on TeamViewer and Carbonite. And in traditional kind of German bluntness, when TeamViewer told their customers that they weren't using best practices and that in fact TeamViewer hadn't been breached, it was because of a password reuse attack they got told that they were being too harsh on their customers, which I found very, very interesting. We've seen some internal attacks, and the nice thing about internal attacks are generally, they're pretty spectacular. In this particular case, this was a hosting company in China where the network admin, I guess, had a rage quit and deleted a whole bunch of virtual machines on his way out the door. Okay, it's pretty blatant, but you know, you have to consider that there may be an internal attack vector as well. Physical data centers, De Delta Airlines. This is a really interesting one because as you know, and I hope you weren't traveling in America at the time this happened. I'm Canadian, by the way, so I can make fun of Americans and then apologize because that's what we do. Um, Delta Airlines claimed that a very loud noise shut down their servers from their fire alarm system. The actual fire chief said that they never received an alarm from Delta, uh, Delta's data center about any sort of fire. So there's a whole bunch of mystery going on there. Perhaps somebody kicked a plug out of a socket and brought worldwide air traffic control um, down for that company. There's also other attack vectors as well. Displacement and innovation. Um, bigger, cheaper, stronger, faster can always come along in the SaaS space. There are very innovative people that are spinning up uh, freemium services and as a result of the SaaS marketplace, there's a tremendous amount of uh, open source uh, helpful capability that exists there. So you have that attack vector as well. But the most I'm going to see dangerous part of being a SaaS vendor is your customer. If you don't treat them right, they turn on you like rabid animals and go crazy on places like Reddit and LinkedIn, which is painful because a lot of the times, unlike your help desk that has an escalation path, when somebody tags the CEO of a multi-million dollar company because they're pissed off at you, it's probably not in your best interest to uh, downplay that kind of occurrence. Happens on Twitter and places like that. So one of the other problems with being in the SaaS cloud is the litigative landscape of being in the SaaS cloud. This one makes me the most nervous is that 60% would take legal action against an organization if their details were stolen, okay? You know, when we look at this particular situation, we see that these are some pretty important metrics as well, that 51% now consider security to be a main or important consideration, and 48% would be willing to pay more in order to work with a provider that has better data security. So in terms of a marketing win, putting those type of statistics in, uh, forward to executives really makes a difference. So what is, the big driver, well, the big driver is security. And three quarters of your customers or three quarters of the conversations are going to be 79% of businesses expect security to become higher, a higher priority. So as a SaaS vendor, and when the number one driver for changing 
company's approaches is the SaaS products, it puts me in a very awkward spot because I have to spend a lot and do a lot in order to ensure my customers don't go crazy if we have some sort of security incident. Now, I want to bring some context to the discussion. These numbers came from a, from a group called IC3 in the United States, the Internet Criminal Complaint Center. Okay, has a nice title. They get metrics on what actually is occurring with cybercrime. And oddly enough, when you look at the by victim counts, it has nothing to do with malware here. It has everything to do with things like identity theft, non-payment, non-delivery, uh, auction fraud, all of those kind of things. So when we think about security now, you know, I like to try and think about where can I be most effective given this type of attack vector. And when we have craziness in the marketplace, and I think we'll get to a slide that talks about this, where the threat of ransomware is completely outrageously pushed forward by every vendor saying you have to have an anti-ransomware solution and let me sell you that today, versus business email compromise where hackers just ask you nicely to transfer money to a Chinese bank. That's actually more successful than a malware attack, right? What's interesting though in all of this, the IC3 is not tracking fraudulent domain registrations for use in phishing attacks, okay? And the important part of that is, is that 41% of the malicious domains are actually in the United States. Okay, let that sink in. It ain't Russia, it ain't China, it's the US that's responsible for 41% of the malicious domains that are attacking us, right? And if you wanna get even more into the numbers from IC3, 21% of the entire cybercrime that is going on in the United States is in California. Okay, so if you have a data center in California, expect the worst, right? But it's really interesting to me to see how selective the data is that's out there, right, with outrageous claims. So, again, what I'm railing at us here is when we think about the cybercrime problem that we have and being a SaaS vendor, I have, I have to contextualize that because my organization is probably more likely to transfer a whole bunch of money to some bank than actually hackers breaking into our infrastructure and taking over our customers. It's really interesting to have that discussion. So when I come to the table, I try to plead with the organization and say, user awareness training should be mandatory and it should be continuous and it should, go on, it should be ongoing in the organization. And we should have two people uh, stamp approval for any large transfer of money. Very important issues. So here's the other problem. My infrastructure is getting attacked by other people's infrastructure, okay? And we all live in this world together. So one of the biggest problems that we have, and I know moving SSH to different ports isn't exactly the most you know, awesome uh, way of uh, stopping cybercrime, but it helps and it prevents, it's a tiny layer of your defensive strategy. But the problem is, is other people's mistakes are responsible for my pain, okay? And that's another problem to keep in mind too, because there's a whole bunch of innocent bystanders whose infrastructure is being used to attack mine. So I can't exactly start burning other people's infrastructure down to the ground. Now we all sort of saw this, and this was really interesting, okay? I don't have a malware problem in my cloud SaaS infrastructure at least not yet. I have what appears to be a bunch of development problems, okay, as well as the lack of compensating controls if we have to do something crazy because for whatever reason, nobody even knows how that code works anymore, okay? And when we tried to rip it out, we couldn't rip it out with ripping apart the entire infrastructure. So the biggest problem that SaaS faces right now is as we develop this thing, and I'm gonna repeat, you know, the, the verbatim, we didn't do it with security in mind. Seven years ago, the internet was a friendly place. Now, it wants to rip your face off. So this is what we're faced with. The reality is, is that most of this is responsible for the attacks that we're getting because this infrastructure is getting owned that has these vulnerabilities, and then it comes after anybody else that's playing out there in the internet. So what I'm saying is that when we 
think about the FUD, when we think about the cloud, and we think about security, we actually have to move away from this sensationalism of the malware threat or the ransomware. We need to look at more broadly. And think of it this way. The largest consumer fraud that has ever been perpetrated, okay, happened as a result of a piece of malware. Can anyone guess? Volkswagen. The EPA, okay, identified some malware, as far as the EPA was concerned, that allowed Volkswagen to bypass environmental safety standards. Well, it's really interesting. The largest fine ever assessed by the ICO was 400,000 quid for TalkTalk. Talk. What, the, what the Environmental Protection Agency is empowered to do is actually fine Volkswagen so much money it puts them out of business. So when you think about the threat, the insider threat that faced a company like Volkswagen, and you look at the fact that it was a piece of code, malware, that was written inside the organization that may be responsible for a, <laughs> a very hard time for Volkswagen, you're now beginning, I think, to see the perspective of their sensationalism, and then there's what the real facts are. Right? Also, given the um, outcome of the most recent American election, I sense there will be a renewed focus on email server security. Okay? I think that's a common one. So where do we go with this? So if you're my customer and your infrastructure is polluted and it's attacking folks and it's making a mess of the internet, I need to work with industry and give you some basic security hygiene. Okay? I need to put the equivalent of a little plastic helmet on you so that you don't hurt yourself. So CompTIA is an industry group that put together what they call foundational security for small business, which includes a bunch of that stuff. Okay? For most of the people in the room, you've probably already done this stuff and you're running a lot more complex infrastructure. But my problem as a SaaS vendor is, is I don't know how polluted you are as a customer, but I have to let you in because you're paying me. If, I, if, you're, not gay, you know, if you're not allowed in, I don't make any money, so I've got to fix that problem. The other problem I, need, I have is a flash problem. Okay? I've outlawed it in our organization. Okay, uh, we've, we had a bunch of training videos and we used a $29.95 Amersoft uh, conversion utility to get Flash out of our organization, right? We're advising our customers to do that too. Every time we find crypto locker infections or malware or any sort of attack, it seems to be one of the root causes is Flash. And this data came from Recorded Future in 2015. And uh, in a blog post, I talk about some new data that came to us that is now shifted between Flash and Java because everybody's uninstalling Flash. So it's kind of interesting to see that shift. So about us. So we have 17,000 customers worldwide in 110 countries. We use Rackspace, some of our own gear, and the ability to spool up into Rackspace's cloud uh, on demand. We use AWS for our analytics and hosting, manage about 3 million endpoints, and generate about a terabyte of log a day. Okay? We created a bunch of algorithms um, to look at our data storage and to, to help us get better at finding bad guys and finding what I'm going to call use cases that I'm going to share with you in a little bit but basically, the data science team and the DevOps team are committed to protecting the customer's instances and the platform. So when we actually sit in a room and talk about what are we going to do with our data, my, my answer is we're going to protect our customers with that data. That's what we're going to do, guys, and here's how. Vital ground in the SaaS is authentication. Okay, so again, we have to stomp on this password reuse attack um, type of vector because that's the number one thing that's going to let a bad guy into a customer's um, infrastructure. And what I can do with that information is when I see something like a failed login on scale, I can get an inkling of what type of attack is going on. And again, because we're in a trust model, it basically comes down to this. Now, you're all familiar with the Lockheed Martin kill chain. And so a lot of our educational efforts in order to make our product safer really comes down to helping our customers through education and training. Okay? We walk them through the Lockheed Martin kill chain and say, here's pieces of technology that can help you. And notice the fact that I'm pushing user awareness training, 
quite heavily here, okay? No matter where your architecture is and no matter what type of infrastructure you're using, apply this model and you can see exactly where your pieces of technology should prevent or at least detect what the hell is going on in your infrastructure. So we use this model and we educate people about this model as well. So here's a really great one that we did. So as you know, two-factor authentication is a very useful way of securing your cloud services. But what do you do with data when you see an IP address that attempts to authenticate but fails, that fails the two-factor authentication? Especially if it happens a few times. What do you do when that IP address is trying different accounts, right? We can pick that needle out of 10,000 haystacks and we can lower the ban hammer. Or if we're seeing a more interesting attack going on, we can also pipe that into a honeypot network and watch them pound away on that and collect more intelligence. The point that I'm trying to say is that if you're talking about threat intelligence in your organization, contextualize it. What good, if you don't have customers in Israel and you don't have customers in Saudi Arabia, what good is knowing that an IP address is busy attacking Israel from Saudi Arabia? It's not helpful to me. So build your own threat intelligence capability, focusing on the data that you can get from your logins. It's really, really helpful. The other opportunity that we had here was kind of neat because what we could do is look at the session key that is given to the login and track the IP address from that login. Kind of cool, right? What are we looking for specifically? We are looking for a second IP address showing up attached to that session key. That would be a very bad thing, okay? Now, chances are, as a customer goes about his day and things like that, it's quite possible because our session keys are 12-hour ephemeral keys. They disappear after, and there's a requirement to log in after 12 hours. But what's really interesting is that if we know that our customer is in a certain geographic region, and then we see that the IP address that has gone into that session key is from a completely crazy place like Kurdistan, we're pretty certain something crazy is going on with that endpoint. And we can advise them that perhaps their account was compromised or they have some sort of malware like Drydex, which is doing a man-in-the-middle browser type of attack and letting somebody session hijack you. It's also possible that randomly, and I think you would probably know way more about this than I would, but it's possible you may be able to steal session keys off of one of the servers and compromise an account that way. Either way, what I'm trying to do is detect weird ass behavior in the infrastructure by looking at the load balancers and what they can tell me. Now this was really helpful to us. We implemented this very shortly after the team viewer breach because we actually use a slightly different version of TeamViewer in our product. So of course, what did our customers do? They went batshit crazy on Reddit and LinkedIn, thinking that they were also vulnerable because of this TeamViewer breach. So now what we do is we're, we're using the API from Have I Been Pawned, and we're looking for any user IDs, which are based on emails of our customers, and checking Have I Been Pawned to see if those user IDs show up. If they do, we say to the customer, right here, we think your user ID may have been compromised. So, dear God, please change your password because we don't know perhaps even where the origin of the attack took place. We just know that your user ID showed up on somebody's list. The other thing that we can do, and this is more of an of a insider threat analytics, okay? If we don't see a customer logging in for a long time, for a period of long time, we want to help them remove the stale accounts that they might have on their system, thus preventing a type of attack where it could be a malicious insider, could be an employee-based attack, but where the, it's stagnated. Okay? The fact that you know, a lot of us are sitting here with the same user ID passwords for our cloud-hosted services that we had since we joined that cloud-hosted service and have never been prompted for a password reset or password change in 90 days like our traditional on-prem infrastructure leaves me somewhat lacking. And I've been trying to push a user, um, a user configurable uh, password reset um, list. A lot like all of those good GPOs and NT security policies that we all uh, remember fondly, I'm sure. 
This one's pretty cool. So this was based on the idea that we might be able to predict when one of our customers is going to get attacked. It's pretty cool. There was some great research that uh, a researcher presented on typo squatting. That's where fraudulent domains are created to be used in either phishing attacks or uh, drive-by download scenarios. And so there's, um, what we're doing is we're going to calculate those typo squatting domains and then watch to see if they're registered. Okay, and if one is registered, that's a good indication that perhaps an attack is going to be coming from that phishing domain. The other thing that we can do is then give them that information and push that it out to them so that they can add it to any of their blocking software, if they have Mimecast or a Barracuda or something like that. So we're trying to get better at anticipating the type of attacks that our customers are going to face with. And because we know from the, data, the Verizon data breach report, about 74% of our attacks that are coming at us are email-based. This, we hope, will be actually something that we can uh, use to some success. So we also have some other interesting things, too, that we're looking at is unusual activities. So once you've deployed antivirus and once you've deployed something like uh, backup, it would be weird to suddenly turn off backup across a customer's infrastructure and start uninstalling antivirus off of all the endpoints. That indicates something potentially very bad is happening in that infrastructure. So there's a couple of ways that we're, um, this is an earlier card, we're a couple of ways that we're looking at that now to see sort of mass policy changes in the organization and we're going to prompt for two-factor authentication at that point when somebody tries to do something grandiose like turn off backup and then remove all links to the actual backup repository. That seems to be so, what I would call something hostile. I get it if you're going to uninstall our product and you want to go with somebody else's product. I'm totally cool with that, but I don't want it to be as a result of a security incident that we're responsible for, right? So we're doing a couple of other really interesting things too, and this, this one is um, we experimented a little bit with some early analysis of Lockheed. And what we wanted to do is start something sort of like a global threat um, intel thing. Well, it turns out that's a lot of work, and um, to actually do malware analysis, publish information that people can consume, and then actually push it out to our community of 17,000 customers. This was sort of a trial, and I'm looking to try and automate this um, capability by getting a good data feed of indications of compromise, especially when it's a target that hits small, medium business, right? Loki, uh, you guys probably know, is a ransomware strain, and there's now about 200 of them, and the list of compromised servers grows every day that are using for bot command and control. We also have a problem because the Tor network is being leveraged for a lot of that bot command and control as well. So there's more analytical problems that, are, that we're faced with in the, in the way forward. I think, though, that this is one of those things where instead of a security awareness training program for our customers, we can actually prompt them to take action when it's reasonable and prudent to do so, right? But what we can't do is do it for them because there may be some unique circumstances that prevent them from actually doing our, what we prescribe. As an example, I don't know if you know this, but the um, most dental offices use a hosted application uh, called uh, Dentix, and Dentix requires local administrative privileges, Java, and an older version of Flash to function properly. The absolute wet dream for an attacker, okay? That much vulnerability in one place. What's also cool about dental offices? Yes, medical records. So dental offices are a very, very sexy target for the bad guys. And as much as I might tell all my customers, uninstall um, Adobe Flash, many of them won't be able to do that. So, you know, seven-time Grammy Award winner Taylor Swift knows what's going on, aka Swift on security. Um, so what are we proposing? What is sort of the future way forward? Well, we've gone to a daily external vulnerability scan of, of our infrastructure. And mostly because what we're getting is a whole bunch of new potential bugs that all you people find that we want to make sure that we're not vulnerable for. 
right? Everybody knows about what it looks like when you get a firewall with a very old module of PHP, and it gets ripped apart at DeepSec. Um, <laughs> that was pretty impressive. Those guys were awesome. Um, so what we're trying to look at is our own infrastructure, and we're recommending that a lot of their customers take a quick peek at their infrastructure. The other thing that we can do, and it sounds like a really simple thing, I know the IP addresses of my customers. Why? Because they have agents installed on all their machines. Cool. I should know my IP addresses, and if my networking guys can't actually tell me what our IP addresses are of our infrastructure, I'm going to find new networking guys. Okay? But all I need to do is look at that and say, is there any traffic that doesn't belong to a customer coming out of this network? It's pretty straightforward, because if there is, and they're not a customer, and it isn't us, that might be a problem. So it's relatively easy to do, and you can even take that IP information and throw it up against some sort of threat intelligence. Looking at the ban hammer, where attacks, brute force attacks are occurring on our infrastructure, again, you can suck them off to a honeypot environment, pretend that they get in after a random number of attempts and see what they're up to. Also, what you can do is look for IP addresses that are failing logins across more than one user ID and password. That's another way of looking out for it in your logs. Reconnaissance, again, SQL injection, relatively easy to spot now with modern tools if you're running a web application firewall. And DDoS, right? We all need to give tons of money to Cloudflare and others in order to survive the evil DDoSs. So what are some of the resources that we're kind of using and staying in touch with? It's these ones here, uh, the CompTIA Smart Brief, um, very much focused on small, medium business. Um, and then Recorded Future does some great research and great work on IP addresses to kind of look. They do some up and coming uh, type of, um, we're starting to see some traffic there. And the Daily Sentinel, who believes that ISO 27001 will save us all. Because every time they put out an article, the first three paragraphs are really interesting. And then I'm always like, how are they going to try and sell me ISO 27001 on this issue? Well, they do. Um, I wrote this. Um, this is the Cyber Threat Guide, Nine Types of Internet Threats and How to Stop Them. This is what happens when marketing gets a hold of cyber stuff, right? It's a cyber bullet, okay? But actually, um, all kidding aside, I've taken a whole bunch of the different technologies and mapped them to what is appropriate and what is not appropriate for the type of threat that your environment is faced with. And there's a lot of good free stuff there, too. So, yeah, Taylor. Finally, Modern networks today are actually relatively easy to secure, and this goes back to the education. We just have to figure out how to build our security around proactive, reactive, and detective. We like to have it managed all from one console. Having a whole bunch of discrete pieces moving around makes um, transitioning and ma building capability in your organization very difficult. And you know that's kind of everybody's network. I mean, we all look the same, is what I'm saying. And this segregation piece is where really you can have your most valuable um, opportunities to detect crazy stuff, weird stuff that's going on, right? If nobody in your organization is using IRC other than you, if you see the IRC protocol being used from a workstation that doesn't have you on it, then you're probably owned by some sort of bot. The other one is if you're not using RDP externally, block it at your firewall and see if there's any RDP outbound attempts to get out of your organization. That's a great way to see if somebody's been fished into sending a I need help request. And then finally, when you look at the infrastructure that we have, lots of deny rules on DNS, lots of deny rules on workstation activity so that you can track and hunt when something tries to break one of your rules. I don't even want to talk about this because it just makes me crazy, but you know, you can't do an InfoSec presentation to executives without including hackers. Um, my point is this. We are about to fa be faced with an Armageddon in terms of the Internet of Things, right? This film thought that the idea that malware could get into a ship and flip it over and sink it was kind of uh, frightening. Um, and now, given the reality of the IP addresses that we're putting on some things, it's now become the world that we live in. So one of my reasons for being a responsible SaaS cloud vendor and making an effort to educate all my customers is I don't want to get brought down by a whole bunch of DVR systems that they bought and plugged in and didn't change the default passwords. So <laughs> I think we've got time for about three minutes now for questions, roughly.
Oh, we got five minutes? Okay, cool. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it.